Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is from a brand new author to the show, and by the name of Drew the Unquestioned, from over on Reddit, No Sleep. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. I work for the DNR in a unit that deals with cryptids. And this is how we met the greatest cryptid hunter in the history of the unit. Part 2. Let's get straight into that. Since responses to my last post were so overwhelmingly positive, I decided this might be a good place to tell my stories. Well, we don't get much recognition for our work, it being so classified. And so, any praise or acknowledgement from people, even if it's under the guise of a fiction writing, is more than welcome. I have since retired from the business, and any record of me being with the DNR would have been removed or sealed, so there would be no way to verify anything that I tell you. Which is why I feel... I can be completely honest with you about the things we in the Night Stalker unit have accomplished over the years. We don't require your praise to do what we do, but we sure do appreciate it. Now, that being said, one of the questions I received from all of you about the contact ritual I wrote about before is whether I knew of or had contact rituals go wrong or turn out badly. Well, it has been known to happen. And the best case scenario in an event of a failure is that they simply don't show up for the meeting. There have been times when we were blocked in our path to the meeting place and were menaced until we left the area. Others have been injured during the contact, whether that was because of something they did wrong or because that particular pack decided they wanted us out of there was hard to see. Either way, all contact would be suspended afterwards until further notice. The most interesting case of an unsuccessful contact that I witnessed was during a rather infamous situation in the Ottawa National Forest over by Lake Superior. Now, this all happened in the early 90s, and was the closest we'd come to a full-on war with a pack of dogmen. It was also infamous because it was when we first met the man we call the Dog Catcher. Ah, Jericho, the Dog Catcher Jackson. That's quite possibly the greatest cryptid hunter who ever was or ever will be. He has saved that bacon more times than I can count. If a situation gets bad and lives are at stake, we call Jericho. He is the most unkillable man I've ever met. And the reason we had attempted to contact Ritual with a nearby pack was there had been a string of sightings around the National Park. Enough that it indicated whatever pack it was in the area was not shy around people, which was a problem enough for us. But it was the disappearance of hunters, hikers, and even forest rangers in the area that concerned us most. We had contained the area and closed the park to the public, but that would only work for so long. Dogmen are nomadic creatures for the most part. The witness reports were also very disturbing. They described the dogman that was estimated to be over 10 feet tall and had only one eye and a bald patch on the right side of the head that looked to be burn scars. If this was the dogman causing the problems, or we might be dealing with a rogue alpha. After we had managed to collect evidence of the dogman in question, we attempted a ritual of contact at a nearby forest where there was a meeting place. I personally conducted a ritual, and it was the only one I had been unsuccessful at. Well, it went well, right up until I presented the evidence to the Alpha. It sniffed at the samples and recoiled. I could have sworn for a moment I saw fear in its eyes before it turned on me and began growling. The others followed suit, and I backed away slowly, more scared than I'd ever been in my life. They paced me all the way back to my camp, and watched until I packed up and left. This was unprecedented. Whoever this rogue alpha was, or had gained a fearful reputation among its own kind. Something which was not an easy thing to do among dogmen. Our options from there, well, they were limited. We could keep people out of the area, but we couldn't be everywhere. There would be inevitably some foolish campers or unscrupulous hunters who would ignore the signs and slip by our patrols. We couldn't just fence off the whole area. This was hundreds of miles of hard terrain. We needed to send in a strike team. And we had teams trained and ready for situations like this. And these boys were the best of the best. Fully informed on tracking 
hunting and killing various cryptids. We sent them in and they stayed in contact with us for the first few days before going silent. We could hear gunshots in the distance, but soon they stopped and we never saw those boys again. The strike team had never failed to bring down a dogman before now and we were running out of very limited options. I think we were getting to the point where we were considering calling in the National Guard and doing a full sweep and kill of the entire area. One of the units spotted something. It was a pillar of smoke deep in the forest, too big to be a campfire. The last thing we needed right then was a forest fire, though that would solve our problem in a costly way. They also reported hitting several explosions from the same direction, and the decision was made to send out a team by helicopter to assess the situation. They came back with Jericho Jackson, looking like he'd been chewed up and spit out. And the report they gave, oh, it was incredible. The source of the fire turned out to be an ancient crumbling shack, long forgotten to the deep woods. All around the shack were smoking craters, improvised booby traps and trip wires. They said that it looked like a scene out of an old Vietnam war zone. They recovered the bodies of two juvenile dogmen, both male and burned to almost ashes. They followed a trail of blood and drag marks to the body of the largest dogman we have on record. It could only be the rogue alpha that we were looking for. It was barely recognisable. Most of its fur had burned off and the skin was cracked and oozing blood. Both of its hind legs were hanging by the skin and the bone jutted out of the top at the break like broken teeth. Almost like it had been walking on them. The left hand was gone along with most of the front teeth. The lower jaw was just ragged pieces, and the mouth and throat was a bleeding black mess. They followed a the blood trail further into the woods, and almost opened fire when they spotted a dogman standing over what they thought was a body. And they thought maybe it was protecting a recent kill, until they backed off enough for it to relax. They said it sat on its haunches, and licked the man's face until he stirred, and they could see that he was alive. And they debated on if they should kill it or drive it off, but they agreed the creature was only protecting the man, not attempting to harm him. One of them drew the short straw and approached slowly with a medkit. The dogman gave a short warning growl and backed away, watching them closely. They radioed it into us and we had a medical chopper there in five minutes. I myself actually got to examine the scene and let me tell you, it was terrifying how brutal and effective this man had been with improvised traps and weaponry. For a single person to kill not just one, but three dogmen, one of them being the biggest and meanest on record. It was nothing short and miraculous. I desperately needed to talk to this man. Now, the interview itself is in our records. I'll try to find a copy to transcribe here for you. I think I have to pull some strings to get it, but rest assured, this story is one that needs to be told. My name is Jericho Jackson. I did three tours in Vietnam with the Army Rangers. Could have gone officer, but after the things I've seen over there, the things I was ordered to do for all the wrong reasons, well, you can imagine their surprise when I spit in the face of our president when he presented me with a Medal of Honor. They had me dishonorably discharged for that. The only reason I went back for three tours was because I felt alive and real when I was in the field. And because I wanted to make sure as many of us out there made it home. As much as I hated that war, being back home, oh, I was worse. I had no direction, no purpose. Most guys went off to start families, but, but I, I couldn't even imagine creating something so beautiful and precious. All I was ever good at was killing. The ugliest thing a man has to do in life. The years between coming home and the day First Lieutenant Dirk Lancaster called me out of the blue were one long fever dream that blurred together and disappeared the minute I tried focusing on it. When I talked to Lancaster again, it was like standing on solid ground after years of drift on the ocean. He invited me to get together for Nam Vets in Detroit. He said most of the old team would be there. It was just a gathering in a rec center basement, like a support group meeting. Cold coffee and warm beer. Tom Wilson was there, the man with the golden eye. Well, he was the wrath of God with a rifle. He used to practice by shooting flies out the air with a pellet gun. You could even tell him which fly and where to hit it, and he'd pull it off four times out of five. He was also the funniest man I'd ever known, 
and he could crack a joke at the most awkward and inappropriate times and still get a laugh out of you. And now he looked like he'd lost 80 pounds and gained 80 years. I knew the hallmarks of a junkie anywhere. The only other guy I knew there was Malcolm Gibbons. He was a communications specialist, although he always said he was the muscle of the team and would wrestle anyone who challenged it. He was so covered in tattoos his skin looked blue and his face was a permanent shade of red. Now, he looked smaller somehow, and what would a pronounced limp. Lancaster looked the best of us all. I swear he hadn't aged a day. The only thing that betrayed his age were the lines around his eyes and the white in his beard and sideburns. Now that we talked about the war and what we'd done since then, the subject of Tom's junk problem came up and Lancaster proposed a hiking trip in the Ottawa National Park. Just the four of us with minimal supplies and a thousand miles from any drugs or junkies. It would give us a chance to help Tom get clean and spend time out on the field together, like old times. We all agreed and we went up that weekend on the north side of the park. What I didn't tell them was that before I'd left and told my apartment manager, I was moving out and gave everything I owned to the Salvation Army. All the money I had sent to the only family I had left. I had no intention of ever leaving that forest. I had no place in this world. And I left nothing of myself behind. And I can't begin to describe the feeling of total freedom I experienced out there. It felt like I was back in the jungle. Only I had no orders and no enemies. Just my blood brothers and the quiet cacophony of nature. It was the first time that I felt so alive since I came back. And I could see the same energy in the others. We talked. We joked. We foraged. We hunted. Time didn't matter anymore. No more days of the week, no more clocks or appointments or meetings or deadlines. I didn't notice at first, but things well, started getting strange out there. There were these screaming howls at night sometimes, half in the distance, and none of us could figure out what it was. And Tom, he was convinced it was Bigfoot, and we all just laughed and accepted that it could be. Then there were these moments of silence. One minute the fries was chattering and humming with life, and the next it would all stop. Then, after a while, the noise would come back like nothing had happened. Those moments always made me uneasy. It was the same way before an attack or an ambush, like nature could detect the coming of violence and held its breath waiting for it. And I noticed these things, but they held no interest for me. I was lost in a feeling of freedom and peace with my brothers. I thought nothing could bring us down until Lancaster found the syringe in Tom's boot. Seeing that, I was like being shaken awake out of a dream. We all just stared at Tom, expecting an excuse or a confession. Instead, he gave us a sad smile that hit me harder than seeing the syringe. He told us it wasn't a fix. It was an emergency exit. The stuff in that tube made heroin look like ginger beer. He wanted a way out. He wanted to go out on his own terms. And that brought us all out into the open and I realized I wasn't the only one who had no intention of ever going back. Malcolm said he lost his leg to diabetes and his wife ran off with his brother, along with most of his savings. Lancaster told us he'd gotten diagnosed with bowel cancer and the doctors had given him less than a month. That surprised me the most. Lancaster was like an icon to me, someone who never aged and never faltered. I guess it's how most people see their father. I never got to see my father that way. It never gave the impression he was anything but a cruel, sadistic drunk. I told him about intending to live out the rest of my life out there. How the world seemed to have turned on me after I came back and nothing seemed real or even tangible to me. I was a dead man in a living world. An echo. They all knew how that felt and we all understood what this trip really was. After that, the high feeling had faded but it also felt more real. I wasn't expecting to wake up at any moment. We had all entered the moment itself. It was a few days later the howls at night sounded closer. And Tom spotted a deer thirty feet up a pine tree. Where its guts hanging from the branches like Christmas tree garland. I remembered having to watch for leopards in the jungle. We had to watch the trees for corpses or eye shine. But there was nothing out here that would do that. Bears climb but they don't eat in the trees. Neither do cougars. We all felt uneasy after that. Something was wrong, but we wouldn't know why until that night. 
we set up on the edge of a swamp and we're sitting around our small propane stove. We try not to use campfires because someone could spot the smoke or the light of the fire at night, which was unlikely, but possibly we weren't willing to allow it. And it was when another wave of silence hit us that I started to feel tension in the air. It made my skin tighten, my hair stand up. The others must have felt it too because they were all alert and looking around, same as me. Something, or I was watching us. I'd felt this before, when we were about to get hit hard by the Fear Kong, or when an ambush was about to start. Lancaster reached down and turned the stove off slowly. I closed my eyes and focused on intensifying my night vision, a trick I'd learned from a guy in training. When I opened them again, I could see shapes in the starlight. Not enough to read, but enough to see. Lancaster motioned, and we got into position, back to back. He held up a long rod, which I recognized as a flare, and I saw him hold up a hand, putting down one finger at a time. I focused on the woods, looking for anything moving, and I spotted a shape looking around a tree at us, and tried to signal to the others, but just then, a bright flash lit up the area, and I saw it. I think my mind sort of flipped like an overtaxed breaker at what I saw. Because what I saw, well, it was impossible. I entered a state of liminal time where everything slowed to a crawl. This had happened before, usually when something terrible was happening. And those moments remained in my mind like scars. It was an animal. It was hunched over slightly and looking around a tree, but it had to be at least six feet tall. The head, well, it was canine. Long muzzle, pointed ears that stood straight up on its head like horns. But his body was more like a chimpanzee. Broad shoulders, long arms and paws that looked like hands with huge claws like a bear. It was a dark grey colour, and the fur was short for the most part, except for around the neck and back. Oh, the eyes were a bright yellow, and they winced at the bright flash. At first, I thought it was a costume, a prop from a movie or a mask. But as it winced and recorded the light, I could see all the organic articulations of muscles and skin, and I knew it was real. I shouted the direction I spotted it to the others, but I may have just mouthed it. I couldn't hear anything but the rush of my own blood in my head. The thing had jumped back and let out a screaming howl, the same terrible noise we'd been hearing for days. The others spun around to face it. Tom had a clock raised and ready even though his eyes looked like they were trying to jump out of his head. He fired a shot, and I saw the bullet hit the thing that sent a mass, and a puff of fur come loose. If I hadn't seen it hit, I wouldn't have even known. It had been shot because it didn't so much as flinch. I had spun around and dashed into the dark, crashing through the underbrush like a speeding truck. We all just stood there, staring at the dark, the flickering orange light of the flare showing only the first few layers of trees. There was a scrabbling sound and a rain of needles and bark above us. Lancaster shouted the word treason. We all looked out, pointing our weapons in the direction the sounds were coming from. And there was a loud thud and something hit in the ground to our left. And we waited until its eyes caught the light of the flare and glowed like a cat's before we all opened fire. And once the ringing in my ears faded, I saw Malcolm looking somewhere else, looking like he'd gone blind and wasn't sure where he was. I tried to get his attention and snap him out of it when his eyes snapped onto something ahead of him, and he let out a war cry that was so harsh I could hear his vocal cords tearing from the string. Tom and Lancaster spun around to look after him as Malcolm charged into the dark, still screaming like a madman. He jumped at something, and it was a loud snarl and a crashing of undergrowth. Lancaster shouted for Malcolm to get back so they could get a clear shot, but, but he was like a man possessed. He wrestled and stabbed the creature, growled and slashed. It was like watching dogs fight. And the thing managed to get its mouth around Malcolm's neck. And his scream was at first harsh and low, but rose in pitch and faded into gurgling, hisses as the thing tore his throat away. We hesitated only a moment before opening fire on the thing, landing a half a dozen shots in vital areas before the thing lunged into the trees. How the hell was this thing still moving? It had taken shots to vital areas, and I knew they'd hit it. Was it bulletproof? Some kind of monster. The town ran over to Malcolm and swore and cursed, trying to stop the blood gushing out of the hole in his neck. I could see Malcolm's eyes were empty. There was a slight rustle as the creature appeared, rocketing towards Tom. 
It was like the thing was faster than the sound had made. The thing tackled Tom and they both tumbled into the underbrush. Lancaster was shouting something and bringing up his rifle. The thing was on top of Tom and Tom was holding an arm up to defend himself by shooting with the other as the thing slashed at him, jaws locked on Tom's forearm. And I could see bits of fabric and chunks flying away from him and blood that looked black as motor oil in the light of the flare. Tom fired his last shot and dropped the gun to reach for something else. When he poured out a syringe, I felt a wave of cold relief. He was going out on his own terms after all. Then he looked at me for what seemed like a few minutes, in liminal time, and he grinned. He then held the syringe like a knife and jabbed the creature in the same hole he'd made earlier, lodging it there, plunger depressed. The thing's eyes widened, and it pulled back at Tom's arm while grabbing his neck in the chokehold. There was a crack somewhere inside him, and a terrible ripping sound as the arm tore free. And the creature ran towards the woods but stumbled and crashed into a tree, sending down a shower of needles and letting out a pained yelp. It looked like a drunk trying to find his footing, stumbling and flailing desperately into the dark. Lancaster went over to Tom, who was gurgling something with a wide and bloody grin. The thing had slashed two gaping holes across Tom's neck, and the blood had already slowed to a trickle. We could still hear the creature crashing in the woods ahead and it let out a mournful howl. And Lancaster and I locked eyes and his were almost glowing with rage. He signaled for me to flank the creature while he approached it dead on and I circled through the trees towards the cries and thrashing. And what I saw uh, it made my blood freeze in my veins. It was another one standing over it. The one from before was trying to stand, its eyes rolling wildly. The other was sniffing at it, emitting a low, confused whine. A third bounded into view, and I felt my heart fall into my gut. I looked over at Lancaster, who was spotted them as well, and he looked pale. A low, rumbling growl came out of the darkness that made me shudder uncontrollably. A terror gripped at me that I had never known before. A primal, forgotten instinctual reaction that had laid dormant in my DNA until that moment. I was no longer a person. I was an animal in the presence of an apex predator. And what stepped out of the dark made the other creatures we'd seen look like puppies. He had to be over seven feet on all fours, and as wide as a car. Its head was massive, and the fur on one side was gone, showing a network of scars as hard and dry as wood. The eye on that side was milky white, and the other seemed to glow a golden sunset color. It approached a down creature. I noticed the others recoil as it got close. When it sniffed at it and whimpered pathetically. The large one wrinkled its nose in a look of utter disgust. It growled low and harsh, and the other two cowered back away. The one on the ground whined and rolled over in a submissive position, its eyes rolling around crazily. What happened next was the last thing that I expected. The big one slashed the one on the ground, ripping huge gashes and sending organs and chunks of flesh flying. The creature let out a yelp and didn't even have time to react before it was killed. And the big one looked down at it with an unmistakable disgust before looking back up right at me. And everything in me let go and I couldn't stay on my feet. It growled again and let out a terrible noise that seemed to be equal parts roar and howl. I felt outside of myself. I saw myself get up and run dodging trees and bushes with a speed I didn't recognize. I heard Lancaster fire off a few shots towards what must have been an avalanche behind me before turning to run as well. Now I couldn't feel anything. I could only hear my heart beat and see myself running blindly into the trees. And I fell back into myself when the ground disappeared beneath me with a splash and my feet sank into thick mud. All my senses snapped back into place with a deafening cacophony of sights, sounds, and smells. I turned to look behind me in time to see a wall of fur and claws barreling towards me. I wanted to look it in the eyes it killed me. I wanted it to know I wouldn't die in fear. But something got in my way. I was able to recognize that it was Lancaster just before the creature hit him like a speeding semi, knocking both of us down into the muck. A thick... Cold sludge filled my ears and mouth and every part of me moved with a terrible slowness that burned my muscles. I could feel Lancaster against my back thrashing wildly. I wondered how he was able to move like that in the mud before I realized it wasn't him. 
I was feeling that thing tear into him from above. A rage I had never known filled me, chasing away the shock of the cold and the fog of the impact. He gave me this chance. Lancaster gave me his life for this. Don't fuck it up. I started to reach through the thick blackness around me. Felt a root and grabbed the hold, pulling myself forward. I clawed at the thicker ground below and slowly made my way through the sucking darkness. When my chest was burning and my mind was ready to breathe in the filth around me, out of the sheer desperation, I made my way to the surface. And for a terrifying moment, I thought there would be no surface. But when I exhaled, my nostrils cleared and pure, empty air entered my lungs. As the mud dripped out of my ears, sounds returned and I heard splashing and tearing noise behind me. I pushed away until I felt the trunk of a tree and sat at the bottom of it, leaving only the top half of my head exposed. And I could see them ahead of me. The large one had pulled the body of Lancaster out and tossed it aside and was now slashing at the mud around it, searching for me. The two smaller creatures watched from the sides, looking around for any sign of me. And the large one let out a frustrated bellow and sniffed at the air desperately. And I waited and watched, numb from the cold. The creature sniffed around the area for a long time. They must not have been able to smell me in the mud. Even when they disappeared from sight, I didn't move. And when the sky went from black to blue with a rising sun, I didn't move. I couldn't see Lancaster's body from where I was, but I could see a single ghost-white hand protruding out of the mud where we'd been attacked. Now I didn't move, except to blink, until I heard the sounds of the forest return. And when they did, I stood slowly and waded through the brackish water and moss to where the hand stuck out. The mud and the water was a dirty wine color, and everywhere there was pieces of torn cloth, bits of bone and flaps of skin. I wasn't sure what to do so, I started to collect as many pieces as I could. Well, I could hardly see through the tears, and my chest tied in with each hard bone or soft chunk I'd find in a muck. I went to where the ground was dry enough to dig without the hole filling with water. I started clawing at the dirt, ignoring the pain in my fingers, ignoring the blood mixing with the soil. I was digging in a frenzy. All the memories I'd kept playing back in my mind. And when I came out of my trance, my hands were ruined. A bloody mess, and it was hard to breathe. I put everything I could find for First Lieutenant Dirk Lancaster into the hole I dug and pushed the dirt back in on top of him. I stacked the largest stones I could carry and built a small cairn on the spot. I said the few possessions I could find in the swamp around the cairn. His knife, a keychain with a picture of his wife, and a zippo ladder with his name and rank engraved on it. I searched for what felt like hours, but I couldn't find his text. Now the adrenaline was running out of me, and I felt like I might just fall over and sleep for the next month. What the hell were those things? They had to be long gone by now. And I thought about the others and about the camp we'd made. All our supplies were there, and I had to honor Tom and Malcolm. I looked up at the sun and guessed it had to be late afternoon and tried to orient myself in the direction of our camp. Recon was always my strong suit, fortunately. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an absolutely immense and awesomely accurate story this has been. Still one more part to go, a big finale. I should have that out within the next few days. A mighty thank you to the incredible author, Drew the Unquestioned, from over on Reddit No Sleep. I had my eye on this one months ago, Drew, and I'm so glad you allowed me to narrate it on the channel. I really hope you enjoyed my rendition, and I certainly will keep my eye out for any more of your work in the future. Well, guys and girls, I already know you sank your teeth into that one and can't wait to hear more. But as ever though, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. 
It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now, if you can pen a story packing that much punch, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. Well, guys, quite possibly one of the best Dogman stories I've ever read off of the Reddit platform. And I'm sure you'll agree with me. That was incredibly accurate and chest pounding fun. As ever, I hope you're all well and happy, your family and friends alike, and you're all looking forward to a wonderful Christmas just around the corner. But above all, guys, remember be safe, not 